you're listening to the Hit or Die podcast with hosts Jake Soldati and Chad Rothberg. Hey everybody, welcome to the Hit or Die podcast episode 33. Uh, we're here with our very own uh, Marcus Walden uh, out of Central High School. Uh, were you a three or four year letterman there? Uh, three. Three year? Uh, Fresno City for one season had a five and one record, uh, three seven four ERA. 42 Ks and 43 innings. Uh, drafted in 07 in the ninth round by the Blue Jays. Uh, was called up in 2014 by the Blue Jays. Picked up by Oakland in 2014. 2015 signed with uh, the Cincinnati Reds. He was released 10 days into the season. Uh, played any ball for with Lancaster, winter ball. Signed with Minnesota Twins in 2016. Uh, December of 2016 signs with the Boston Red Sox. Was in AAA during the 2017 season. Made the opening day roster for the Red Sox in 2018. Spent the majority of 2019 with the Red Sox, appearing in 70 games and finishing the year 9-2 and two with a 3.81 ERA and 70 K, 76 Ks and 78 innings. <laughs> <coughs> Chad's a little under the weather. Yeah, he is. Uh, dude, thanks for coming out, man, I, or letting us come to you guys Yeah, and uh, use your facility. Uh we like to start back where, where it all began. Central, um, you played for Pat, Pat Ware, right? Pat Ware was my coach my sophomore, junior year. You know, talk about getting into city, what options you had, and, and even what Valley baseball was like at the time. No, I mean, our, our Valley, the track, was really good at the time. We had some big-time guys. We had Ryan Cook was there for a little while with Clovis High. Yep. We had Justin Wilson was pitching at Buchanan. Um, that was my sophomore, junior year. We had a pretty good team out at Central. Uh Playing middle infield with my brother was one of the best things that, that happened for me. That was a pretty good year with me, my sophomore year. My brother playing as a senior. Junior year, we ended up being pretty good. We were, I think we ended up losing to Buchanan both years, my sophomore, junior year in the semis. And then my senior year, a lot of my my guys that I've been playing with my whole career ended up heading out, <clears throat> going to Fresno City. And then that senior year, I kind of knew that's where I wanted to play. Uh, watch my brother there, watch the culture there. Um, I still try to get back to Fresno City once or twice a year and just see what's going on, man. And I, I love the coaches there. Not a whole lot of options coming out of high school, honestly. I had one offer from a team from in Pennsylvania somewhere, but nothing, nothing that was that was standing out to me. Uh, ended up going to Fresno City. wanted to be wanted to be on the back end of their bullpen. I knew I wanted to throw one or two innings at a time, uh, air it out, and let it go. And ended up working out pretty good for me. Yeah. When you you know coming out of high school. You say there's not a lot of offers. I know maybe it's been true even in years past, but I know especially now, like, some guys look at that as, you know, they failed. You know, did you did you take that as, like, whatever, I'm just going to go to city and get my work in and do what I got to do? It didn't phase you at all? No, not really. Uh, out of high school, I played shortstop my whole life. I didn't really pitch. I pitched, I think, 30 innings my senior year in high school. And that was it. So I knew I had to start with getting as many innings as possible. I threw a lot in the, I threw a lot in the winter. I probably threw 25, 30 innings in fall ball that year, just get my arm going, trying to become a reliever, trying to learn how to throw, how to pitch. Uh, mechanically, I was so screwed up. I mean, I didn't know it at the time, but I was so screwed up. It ended up changing my career in the long haul. But that was something I just wanted to keep, keep pitching, keep working, gaining velocity, obviously. That was the one thing that I knew would get me out of college baseball. I want to go play professional baseball. That was all I really cared about, even when I was 10, 11, 12 years old. Wanting a chance. That's all you can ask for. You get a chance, now you're able to play as long as you can. So wait a second. <laughs> In high school, you mainly played infield. All I played was infield. And I was <laughs> starting shortstop my sophomore year. You go to City. So you and your brother played side-by-side side for one or two years? One year. Rob played second. I played short. And then... A little bit into the year, I ended up moving to third. He ended up moving back to short. So you go into city with the mindset that you're going to pitch? Oh, yeah. And, I mean, obviously, Coach Solberg, somebody figured something out because you were only there a year. That's it. That's cr- I didn't even know that, that you didn't even pitch in high school. But that's what I'm saying. That's insane. And this is now, because Monday we talked to Eager, a position player kind of turned pitcher. Oh, happens all the time. Happens in pro ball all the time. And, but, I mean, that quick? Kenley Jansen. That, well, yeah, that's true. Kenley Jansen yeah. was a catcher yeah. on the Netherlands team. Yep. Four yeah. years later, he's a closer for the Dodgers. There's some videos out there. Him, it's Come pretty on. insane watching him behind the dish. Too. 98 like, behind the dish. Freaking cannon. Yeah. Do it. I just think just to have that quick success, you know, you, you 
turn it into something. I mean, you were a top ten with ninth round pick. Ninth round. I mean, in a year, that's why I'm saying. Yeah, he, but go to <clears throat> talking about that for our listeners out there. It didn't just happen. No, right. It didn't happen. He he went with the mindset of I'm going to be a pitcher. I'm probably going to come out of the pen. I got to work as hard as I can to become the best reliever on this staff. Yeah. Um. So it wasn't like, oh, you're going to pitch, go out there and just throw, and you did good as good as you did, and you get drafted. He had to put in the work, you know, learning a whole new position. And it's not like pitching is so easy. It's different, like no. going from second base or shortstop to outfield. Oh yeah, you know, so, shortstop <clears throat> to second base was the worst mistake I ever did for three months of my life. <laughs> I couldn't do it, you know. But pitching wise, I mean, I've always I was gifted with a good arm. Obviously, I had a good arm throwing across the field. But when I started pitching, I was 86, 88. It was actually Tom Donald is the one that, walking into my senior year, I go to a uh, area code tryout or something. Hey, anybody want to throw the seventh inning? Pfft, I do. 88, 90. I'm a pitcher. Let's go. You know, my, and my brother was talking to me. I got an older brother. And talking to him, talking to Brian. Hey, let, let's try to get on the mound. Let's see what you got. See what you got. All right. So I worked that summer. Pitched a little bit in high school, obviously, 30 innings or so, and walked into Fresno City with uh, probably about 60, 65 innings under my belt. Not a whole lot, no, obviously. No. But arm speed's getting better. I was in September, October. We had some big scout days, I guess you would say, or, or fall camp, and I was 92 to 95. And I kind of knew I was going to get drafted at that time. I didn't know where. But I knew if I got drafted, I was going. Give me a chance, I'm gone. I remember my last final for Fresno City. I called my agent at the time, or my advisor at the time. Hey, I don't care if they offer me five grand. I'm going. No, 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 no. You can't tell them that. I said, I, that's my last final. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do this. If I have an opportunity to go play Pro Bowl, I'm going. Because then that's when the journey starts, obviously. Yeah. Long journey from there. Long, but that, <laughs> long journey for you. But that's where that, that you want to start that journey, right? I mean, that was my mindset even growing up. If I got a chance, I'm going to take it. There it is again. You, you regret some stuff, and I was, you know, I got my opportunity, and I didn't take it, and I went on. Look, fortunate enough, I got it again, yeah. but you never know what could have happened. You never and know. it's like with you being a pitcher, even, injury, you know, if you don't take it, you hurt yourself. So, um, you know, going from there, Blue Jays, and just kind of go from high school to pitching for the uh, the Rams, and then now you're pitching minor league baseball. Correct, yeah. So What's the, just the difference in now how to react that you're only a freshman, so now you're 18, 19? Still? I was 18 years yeah, old. Yeah, you're young. I, I tried out for my junior college team at 17. Yeah. So, I mean, I graduated 17. Went out there, I was 18 years old. It was, I signed right away. They offered me what I wanted. I asked for $100,000. They said, we'll give you $100,000, all your school, three and a half years of school paid. Deal. Let's go. So I get out there, go out for mini camp. I got a plane flight and a hotel address. That's all I got. I got no clue what I'm doing. My dad's like, hey, we'll see you. All right. I mean, we can step up. Let's go. <laughs> get on the plane. Get out there. I'm in Dunedin, Florida. This is June 20th, roughly 2007. And I get out there and I'm in a world of shock. I've never seen some stuff like this. Full locker room. Never done the whole locker room transaction issues going on. Um, but it was it was a blast. I ended up meeting some two dudes from Canada I lived with and a guy from Australia. Josh Wells, uh, Cuthbertson, and Michael Lynch. And even when I go up to Toronto now, I still hit up Lynch and talk to him. But a uh, good group of dudes were my very first year. We got an apartment, and dudes just hit the ground running, going. How's that being 18, living on your own, having to grow up? Oh, yeah. Having to know – you know, what I got to pay for this month and all that. Yeah, I mean, you're doing the whole thing. I mean, we – luckily, I kind of slid in with them. They had the place from two months previously. Um, so it was it was pretty easy on that transaction. But, I mean, the guy from Australia never lived a day at a home. You know, he couldn't, he couldn't cook, clean, do laundry, couldn't do – I mean, we're talking life skills. And I was fortunate enough that my parents let me move out even when I did go to Fresno City. So I was in the same city, but I lived on my own. I kind of understood what was going on. Still 18 years old, still a kid, but I'm going to go eat Taco Bell at the time. You know, I wasn't going to cook cook in my house. But as you got older and as obviously those transactions, you know, those years move on, we had six guys living in a two-bedroom apartment. I did that my first four years. You know, I didn't get my own room until double A. Four yeah. walls and a door. <laughs> Bro, that took me seven years. 
I was, I was in the living room for the first six. But, I mean, that, those are the, the, the small stuff that people don't talk about on the minor league side. Yeah. Right? We've done we've done some of it. and But that, that was kind of the cool thing going through with the Blue Jays in Dunedin. I was in Dunedin 2007, 2008. I went to extended spring, went to short season, had a good year, came back. All they wanted me to do was throw a changeup. That's all they wanted. Throw a changeup, you're going to move in the system. All right. I had a good sinker at the time. Come back to camp 2009, had a really good changeup. Worked on it with all offseason. Boom, boom, boom. Break camp in high A. Skip low A. Best thing ever. I'm still in Florida now. The weather's warm. I don't got to deal with the northeast cold. Fourth start, blow out my elbow. April 28th, 2009. Against the Phillies, against Dominic Brown, actually. Really? Fastball away. And uh, so I, I rehabbed the rest of that year. Couldn't get it right. Couldn't get it right. Um, end up having get opened up August. I think it's August twenty third, two thousand nine. Open up the surgery. They said, "Hey, if your ligament needs it, we'll fix it. If not, we're going to do nerve flip, six week rehab. You'll be throwing. You'll be ready for spring training." All right, cool. Surgery. Wake up. What I get? Oh, you just nerve flip. Heck yeah! All right, I'm ready. I think it's six week rehab. I'm throwing in off season. Go to camp, it's not working. I'm like 82, 84, no below, just no no trust in that elbow, no strength in it. Tommy John, March 26th, 2010. So that, I mean, I ended up rehabbing for almost two full years. It was two years to the day from April 28th, 2009 to April 28th, 2011 was my first pitch again. So that was a, a weird, weird time in my life, obviously, I ended up coming home. They let me come home and rehab, which was kind of cool. Um, a lot of guys that get that 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 happens to, their their leash is not very long once they come back, you know. And uh, I got really lucky, fortunate. Obviously, I met my wife. I met a lot of other people during that time at home. But it could take it as one of the hardest things in your life, or you can take it as one of the biggest blessings that I had. Obviously. Um, so that, the the rehab process was really hard, but five years later, I looked at it, and it was the best thing that ever happened. Worked out with Matt Garza in 2009, walking in 2010. Oh, what? This is what a big leaguer does? Every day. We were with him pretty much all, um, you almost three said, months. I remember I was working out with you guys, too. Yeah, yeah. But I was still playing. Yeah. Yeah, he's a, <clears throat> it's a different animal. It's a big-time different animal. Yeah. We had no schedule. It was whatever Matt had. You know, obviously he had his, his family at the time, and 7 o'clock at Sunnyside. Boom, 7 o'clock at Sunnyside. You don't even know what you're doing. We walk in. Oh, we're getting in the pool. What? Oh, you better bring your swim trunks, boy. It's going. No, we wore sliders. <laughs> yeah, we, you know, you're bringing something. Um, yeah, but he was in there for about an hour, hour and a, I mean, he just laps and laps and Oh, laps. my gosh. It was it was crazy. But, it, I mean, that, and that's what really opened my eyes that if you want to get there, that's how hard it's going to be. And obviously he was there for a while. He had one of his best years of his career that year. But I think a lot of that has to do with people pushing you and being in that environment of everybody's pushing each other for that same same goal, and you're wanting them to get the same goal as well, but having that camaraderie and the competitiveness in that. Yeah. And that's just got to be – I mean, do you have ever, any thoughts of like – I mean, two years, like you said – this is it for me? Did, kind of. did you ever get into, you know, a lot of people out there might not know how depressed you can get as a, as a player and, um, you know, not having school or something to fall back on. It's like, you know, what, what was that like? Uh, just a little bit of that. I mean, I had no other options. Yeah. What else am I going to do? I'm either going to grind this out and play. I don't, I don't have an option B right now. I mean, I'm, Still 31. I still don't want an option B. Uh, I think a lot of it is I was home, so I was fortunate that I was with some family, with some friends, meeting new people in a different environment. As right, We both rehabbed. I rehabbed in 2009 in Florida all year, and that was tough. That was way harder knowing that I'm tr- still trying to get back and I'm with my team and all that, but nobody's there to support me. When I was home, I knew I was done for the year, so now I'm – there was no like pressure to hurry up and get back. Even when I went back to spring training and camp, 
I was 12 and a half months out, and I told him I wasn't ready. I was 90, 92, decent little slider, little cutter, but I wasn't sharp enough to go compete and go back to high A. So I knew, I told him, I need, I need four more weeks. All right, four more weeks. So I'm, re, I'm still rehabbing to get, you know, throwing bullpens every three or four days. I talked to my pitching coordinator. I said, hey, what's it looking like? Hey, we're not going to send you up north. It's cold right now. Two, three weeks. All right, here's the small stuff. <laughs> Fly my wife out, my, my girlfriend at the time. Hey, come out to Florida. First trip she's been on, and we've been dating for a year and a half now. All right, buy her flight for two days later. Two days later, I fly up to Michigan. My wife, it's six hours before her flight, and it's, nope, never mind. She stays home. I go to Michigan two days after we had the conversation. Hey, you got two weeks. You know, those are the things where it's like, I finally get, I thought I was going to see some family. No. Yeah. You know, there's things like that, like. The family side, the the life side outside of baseball, that's where you get depressed, in my opinion. That's where you see a lot of guys talking about going to Japan, and they come back, and the guys that brought their family have great experiences. The guys that don't, mix and match. Like, some do, some don't. So I think having that family, having that camaraderie or somebody to lean on is obviously a big thing, especially going through rehab and surgeries and things like that. Let's get into, uh, you know, 2014. You get the call. Yeah. What is that? I mean, obviously the feeling is, you, you can, it's hard to describe, but. Um, well, after everything you had to push exactly. through. Exactly. Yeah. And especially going from city, because, I mean, playing at Fresno City, all you see is those names on the wall. There's a and lot of them. And you just want to be one of them. And I think yours is the last one up now. Last one on the right. Uh, Sean Halton was right before you. Yep. And then now you're up there. So what, go back to that feeling of that call. So 14 was a little weird. Um, because I wasn't on the roster at the time. And I didn't, I was so young in my eyes that I didn't understand what the rules of baseball and all these transactions and stuff. I had no clue what's going on. So everybody's telling me that another person's getting called up, Chad Jenkins, who was up in the big leagues a year before, so on and so forth. Manager comes in, I'm getting ready to go to Rochester, New York. We take our bags the night before and, sh- and like ship them. So I'm in, I'm in Buffalo, New York. I get called in the office. It's 8 in the morning. I'm getting ready for a bus ride. Manager calls me in. I get called up. I'm kind of just speechless. Just, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what to do. I'm not ready at all. I got nothing. I'm getting ready for a three-day road trip in Rochester. I'm supposed to go to Toronto. There's a game tonight. All right. He's like, hey, you got to change. You look, I'm wearing sweats and a hoodie. <laughs> oh, I mean, come on. <laughs> You know, four hour bus ride or two hour bus ride or so I go I go home, it's snowing, it's twenty eight degrees, it's Buffalo and April sixth, obviously. And I walk home, change, put a suit on. Luckily I had one from spring training that year. Somehow that was the first year I ever had a suit in my in my closet. And uh pack my bag, get in the get in the uh town car and go up go up to Toronto. And I'm wondering the whole time, I don't have any baseball stuff. Nothing. Oh, your your stuff will get there by game time. I had no, none of my stuff on my very first day in the big leagues. I'm, I go to the clubby. I need everything, man. My stuff's still in Rochester. They had a guy, their clubby brought it up. It came in in the sixth inning. Finally got my glove and my cleats in the sixth. Um, but that was kind of like a weird situation that your call up and everything's perfect and everything, and you're like, panic attack where I got nothing. I got 150 text messages in Canada. My phone bills a thousand dollars. I haven't got a paycheck. Like, you know, like, yeah. And you so don't much. have any of your gear. I got nothing, you know, and, uh, you got a cool story. Yeah. It was a random, a really cool. And who's the first person you called my wife, um, called my wife, called my dad. It was three, four thirty in the morning, probably. Um, but my parents were actually, they wasn't three in the morning. My parents were actually in overseas. They were in Spain or Italy, something like that. And so my wife ended up coming out and she came out the next day. She made it the next morning. Um, I didn't, ended up not pitching obviously the first day or the second day or the third day or the fourth day. Third day was an off day. That's right. Third day was an off day. We have a dinner to go to. And me and my wife, I have to get a, Something other than the suit that I wore on the plane walking to the clubhouse. <laughs> and we got this big, you know, uh, 
what a charity dinner for Toronto. And I'm walking in the mall and me and my wife have to go buy stuff. I literally have $145 in my account. I played in the big leagues for three days and I got nothing, dude. So we go, we're walking and we get something and we see R.A. Dickey walking through the mall. It's his second or third year there. Hey, what are you guys doing for dinner? Oh, I don't know. We're just going to go get something small right here. And, the, you know, the dinner's tonight. He's like, oh, no, you needed to go take her to the steakhouse. You know, and just like he's he doesn't understand where I'm at right now. I got $145 in my pocket and we're trying to buy pants and things like that. So we end up going to that dinner, unbelievable dinner. There We were on the field, unreal. It was Fresno City dinner on that big league scale, on that Toronto. They had 5,000 people there. Jeez. I, mean, it was, I mean, it was bigger than the infield. It was taking up more than the infield. of the, And it was, I mean, there was so many people. And uh, end up going, day three was an off day. I meet up with Jerome Williams. He's with the Astros at the time. And you're talking, I met Jerome Williams in 2006 at the neighborhood park playing basketball when he was in between his big league, you yeah. know, with the Cubs and a couple other teams. And so, like, that was crazy to think that, one, I'm in the big leagues for three years facing the Yankees. Not facing them, but playing against them. Derek Jeter's last year. Three days later, Jerome's in the clubhouse, and I'm shaking hands with Rome again, a boy that was at my wedding four months earlier. And it's so like the small things like that was crazy in that first call up. Ended up getting sent down, DFA'd about a week later because we had three injuries in our infield. We had to call up some infielders. I was the last guy up. I get DFA'd. Uh, claimed by the A's April 18th, I believe. April 18th, get claimed by the A's. Heck yeah. West Coast, first time in my career. Couldn't be happier. I'm playing in Sacramento. My parents live in Sacramento. I'm living at home. And first time in 10 years, just got married. My wife's able to come up, drive up. I was living, I thought I was, the A's, they were not very good at that year. Ended up starting, didn't really have a good year starting. I had two or three bad games, had a couple good ones. I was. I got to throw to Stephen Vogt, which was unbelievable. Great dude, another guy from the Valley. Um, throw to him. Ended up getting sent down, DFA'd and moved to the bullpen all in one meeting. And I had no clue about any of it. You know, and they were like, hey, have you been notified you got DFA'd? No, not at all. All right, well, you got DFA'd. Okay. Hey, they notify you that you're going to get moved to the bullpen. No. All right, I could pitch in the bullpen. I'm down. I'm still in Sacramento. I'm still at home. Hey, and you're also going to double A. What? In Midland, Texas? Oh. I did not, you know, one of the one of the double A leagues I hadn't been in yet, but I want to know part of that. You know, that was the biggest slap in the face to me was getting DFA. I can handle. You moving to the bullpen, I can handle. Going from triple A to double A is such a big difference. Once you get there, that was my first demotion I've ever had in my life, and it was that was harder than later in my life getting demoted or released. Um, that was one of the harder ones because we all were very similar. With our, with our numbers, with our stuff, and things like that. And um, one of the guys that was actually on that team is Josh Lindblom, who just signed a three-year, $9 million deal with Milwaukee. And so thing, guys that were on that team, they, we all went big time separate ways. One's a pitching coach for the Blue Jays. Lindblom was in Korea for a couple of years. I kind of slid around in the minor leagues for a little bit. Um, Dan Straley was another guy on that starting staff in AAA. So it's kind of been weird to see, especially that group, where they all go, how they all – and I mean, everybody's still in the game, though. Yeah. Um, but that was – 14, that was a, a wild year, especially with, obviously, again, the family stuff, the issues – and not the issues, but the wedding and having all that and still being on the West Coast and thinking it was great. And it, that was actually – I thought was going to be the best thing that ever happened to me. That was probably one of the biggest – hard turning points in my career for the worst that I thought was going to be really good. And everything else was looked really, really, really bad. And three years later, I'm like, thank you. That happened. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of weird to see those, those years go through. Um, but running into 15. So I signed with the Reds. The Reds called me the year before 
first day of uh, free agency and offered me a good contract. I ended up signing back with the Blue Jays. They offered me first day again, good money. Perfect. Yeah, I'm down. Go to camp, have a good minor league camp, through all right. They wanted me to be a starter. I was going to be a bullpen guy. Two weeks left in camp, going to start. All right. So I make a start, and they tell me, yeah, you're going to watch over the young kids. I was 25 or 26 at the time. A lot of kids were 20, 21. We had Robert Stevenson, um, Daniel Wright, and one or two other younger guys, Sal. Yeah, Ramon, Sal Romano. Some of the guys that are up in the big leagues now. And, uh, hey, you're going to watch over them. Show me a routine, kind of the day-to-day life of being a starter that they don't really know about. All right. Eight days in, I get canned. I'm like, I, I – <laughs> That was obviously tough driving back from Pensacola two days after it just got off the truck. But <clears throat> that was one of the hardest things, driving back by myself for three days and going, what just happened? I got canned in the meeting. All I'm thinking about is what the meeting that happened eight days previous is, hey, you're going to watch over, you're going to do this as like a mentor kind of thing. You'd have, you thought I thought it was a two-month, three-month guarantee, you know, and – let me pitch my way into whatever's going to happen. But I ended up getting canned and came home. We had just opened up DIB like a month before that. So I got to be home for two weeks setting it up, and then I ended up going to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, uh, signed in the Atlantic League with Butch Hobson. And, again, a thing that a lot of people are going to take as a negative planning in the Atlantic League, best thing that ever happened to me. I mean, by far. The best competition that I got to pitch against – at that time, was in the Atlantic League. We had a lot of guys. <clears throat> I think we had 13 guys in the big leagues the year before on my team in the Atlantic League. Jesus. Yeah. I that's... mean, dude, it was <clears> – we didn't have one guy in the bullpen under 94. We had, we had flames in the bullpen. We had guys. And it was – our team was nasty. I mean, we had some – and that's what's – a lot of them were kind of on their way out. There were 30 to 32, so I became the youngest guy on the team again. I was the same way when I was 18, 19, 20 years old, you know, pitching in high A. And now I'm the youngest, I be, became the youngest guy again. I was 24 or 25, 26, and everybody's 30 to 32. So it was good to be the young kid and learn again. And you kind of get brought back to that 18, 19 year old state of mind that every single one of these guys have been in the big leagues. They got experience. You know, what, what are they going to help you with? Because they're going to help you. That's why they're still in the game. They love the game so much because we know we don't make no money in indie ball. So they're in the game because they either have money because they play in the big leagues or because they care about the game so much. And so I had, like, Zach Jackson played a little bit of time with the Indians, but he was, like, the big, the number two or number three under Cliff Lee when he was with the Indians at the time. And that guy helped me out so much. I actually called him a month ago and talked to him for probably about an hour. And just awesome dude. He's the one that helped me out more than anybody else, I'd say, that was on my staff at that time. And I got a couple other guys that have really helped me out during the years. But obviously just coming home and working with my guys here is unreal. Going to that <clears throat> Lancaster, then going to coming back, obviously you want to get back in the affiliated. Mm-hmm. You're still dreams of being in the big leagues oh, again. Yeah. Well, what <clears throat> point, too, did your, you start your family? You know, I mean, because that's got to play. Oh, yeah. The, I mean, two, the two weeks I was home after getting released <laughs> is when I started my family, which is, I mean, oh, it, it definitely played into what was going on. Um, it was the All-Star break of 15, right around the All-Star break, and uh, I talked to my wife. She's three months pregnant, maybe. I'm playing indie ball. I don't really know what's going to happen. I wasn't throwing good at the time. <laughs> I wasn't. I had a five 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 nine ERA, and uh, you know, I, and it's in a lot of the articles that I've done this year. But I asked her straight up, "Hey, what do you want? Like, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to go back to school and go figure out a career? Or do you want me to keep chugging along through this thing? I mean, we understand we got a baby coming, and I got two years from when I'm released out of pro ball to start my school, and it's paid for. So, I had. Uh, one one more year left until I had to go to school. So that was like kind of my leeway of if I don't get back an affiliated ball, I have to go to school that, or else that money's gone. Now I'm pulling out of pocket, which my pockets are nowhere. I was just playing indie ball. So that was that big decision, and, and my wife was one of the biggest things was keep going. 
keep going. What I mean, what else are we going to do? You know, if she was working at the time, she was making decent money being a uh, doing hair, and she worked her tail off when when I was playing indie ball. She was, you know, and so that was she knew that she could grind it out if I was going to grind it out. And another one of the biggest biggest blessings that's happened to both of us. Yeah, that's not. I mean, that's it's huge. Being on that, the same page and have, yeah, exactly have oh, that yeah. support system and somebody that still believes in you too. <laughs> You know when it's because it's easy to just say no. I need you home. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, that's that's ninety percent. I bet you of most. And who blame? Who wouldn't blame them? Yeah, you know what I mean. I, I, but to, you know, you know the one thing I was telling Chad like the perseverance, man. It's <laughs> and I mean right after that, right after that, uh, right after that conversation, I came back from the All Star break. I threw one time in Sugarland, and after that, I went on thirty nine innings scoreless. And you talk about the confidence and and all that stuff and. And having that backing, I mean, 39 scoreless is, I don't care what league you're playing in. Yeah. It's freaking hard to do. And so I think that was that that was a big turning point in, in changing the way I kind of, not about how I went about my business, but how serious I was about when I'm pitching. And every pitch has to mean something or else. And you never know when it is going to be your last one. I had one of my buddies retire in the middle of that season, and it was tough to watch. But, and that's where... You don't want that. I did, I did not want that to be me. I wanted to keep grinding. They'll take the jersey off my back, and I still I still think that way. And that's that's the way I'm going to have to keep living it, or else you 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 can't take anything for granted, you, you know. And that's that's going to be the hardest thing walking in as we keep going into this thing and never taking it for granted, knowing where we came from, not only from Fresno, but knowing that I did play indie ball. I'm not scared of it, you know, or ashamed of it. No, not at all. <laughs> There were some. It took those moments, those guys, those teammates, oh, that competition. 100%. Oh, hundred percent. It kind of yeah. sounds like it. It uh, rejuvenated. Yeah, it. yeah. Like it refresh oh, yeah. and, and it's like a fresh start. You know, like oh, a yeah. new beginning. Because you're what, and then after that, you get picked up by another organization. You're nobody knows who you are. You're you're setting that tone from the day you walk in, and that's kind of a I don't want to say a fun way to go about it, but that's that's the way it is. Is well, and like you said, some of those guys are. They've they had their kind of their time. It's almost like this is the downside of the hill. Mm-hmm. It's for passion. Oh yeah, it's time. to win. It's because they love the game. It's nothing glamorous about it. Yeah, it's not for the dollars. It's no. it's for the pure joy and love of playing baseball. One hundred percent. You can't help but take something with that like that and 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 apply it and just all right. Remotivate me. Let's go. No, for sure. And that was a big big year for me going going there and, and having Butch as my manager too is unbelievable baseball knowledge. Um, had a blast though. So. Funnest year until last year. <laughs> <laughs> well, so let's get into that. How did it work out to with the Red Sox coming at you, and, and how did that whole deal work? Um, so I was in Rochester in sixteen, sixteen, um, and pitched against Pawtucket a couple times. It was actually their AAA manager is one that wrote me up, um, and kind of sent me in to for them to look at. Uh, talked to one of their scouts, Gus Quattlebaum, and he's like, hey, we just want to make sure you're healthy. So I ended up going back to Venezuela for my second year, threw in one game. Uh, they, they asked me, how are you throwing? Uh, I've been fine. I was hurt in August the year before. It's now November after Thanksgiving I went out there. They said, hey, we want you to throw in a minor league game. Okay. Throw in a minor league game, threw three innings. Came in, threw four innings out of the bullpen, and made one start five days later through five innings. And the Red Sox offered me, hey, you're healthy. How do you feel? Good, good. All right, we'll give you your contract for walking in. You're going to go to big league camp. That was my only thing I cared about. All you got to do is open eyes on the big league staff. That's once, you know, once you're getting in there. And so that's all I cared about. I signed. Two days later, flew home. I'm out. I don't need to. If I already signed my contract, I'm, I'm not here for anything else. Anything. No, no, no. <laughs> exactly. And uh, so I ended up going to camp, and John Farrell was our manager in 17. I had a terrible camp, a terrible camp. I mean, I know all, all I remember is giving up a granny to Kiermaier after walking the bases loaded. So, I mean, that was pretty much <laughs> the peak of that camp. Um, you know, so I told my wife at the time, hey, we can kiss the big leagues goodbye this year. I mean, it's going to be really, really hard. I threw the ball great that year. I had like a 2-8 walking into like a 3-1 towards the end of the year, picking up some innings that were, 
a little dicey. But, uh, no, I mean, I threw the ball great. Ended up going, and they had talked to me earlier about coming coming back and coming back for 18. Yeah, I said, but I want to go play winter ball. I want to see what kind of offers there are, see if there's a change. I love the organization. They do everything top-notch from the tee, from spring training, <clears throat> minor league camp, all the way down, man. It's awesome. And so I knew I wanted to be with them, but if somebody was going to offer me a 40-man or a 40-man roster spot, I got to take it. So I ended up going to the Dominican, pitched one game. Red Sox gave me an offer. Okay, I'm good with that. Ended up signing, played one more month down in the Dominican just to get more innings in because I missed a little bit of time. And walked into camp in 18, and I was throwing the ball the best I've ever thrown it. Well, now you have a new system even. Uh, exactly. Not, new eyes. Everybody yeah. was new except our bullpen coach is now our pitching coach. So a guy that knows who I was, that liked my stuff, that kind of worked with me a little bit in the year before in camp, it's now our pitching coach. So that's the only guy that's kind of familiar with what I do, how I pitch. And it, I mean, that was awesome. I mean, we walked in. Nobody knew that either me or Bobby Pointer had a chance walking into camp. I mean, we had four or five injuries in camp, which opened up a lot of doors. But that's what it's all about. There's not one guy in the big leagues that didn't get lucky to get there. And... So you got to be in the right spot at the right time. But I gave up one run. Bobby gave up one run in 2018 camp. And the hardest thing was about three-quarters of the way through, I'm going to Tampa. I've been throwing the eighth and ninth inning all year, which is mop-up inning, spring training. Hey, just go get some work, kid. We'll see you in AAA kind of thing. Well, I'm starting now. I had no clue. Now I'm starting – against the Rays at the Rays' place. Remind you, 17, walk the bases loaded, Granny, Kiermaier. <laughs> so I'm walking into this thing, and I go, man. And I told my wife, my wife's going with me. I said, this is it. Like, if we throw the ball well here, we got a chance. If we don't, man, we'll, we'll try it again, keep going. Free shotty. I think I, whatever it was, I faced 10 guys maybe, just had – Really, really good stuff that day. I think I walked one guy, gave up one hit, and got a double play. I think that's how I would face 10 guys. And faced Kiermaier twice, with one with a guy on first, and ended up getting a double play. And just that big turnaround changed a lot for having confidence where you know a guy can get you. And you know that he can he can clip you with that cutter in that you threw him a year ago on a 3-2 count. What is he going to do now on this 3-2 count? And being able to get him was when I knew my stuff had been just ticked up just a little bit more. And so that was that day I knew I had a really, really good chance of making that team. And that was kind of one of the – that was one of the cooler days than walking in. Because when I got called up, when I got called in the office, in AC's office, walking into camp, we got one day left. We got the Cubs in an exhibition game. I had already known I made the 25 man because of the guy that was on the border had already got told he wasn't on the 25 man. He didn't make the team. So I'm like, I made it. and I'm like, <laughs> but you fist, can't, yeah, you, no, can't you can't, yeah. because, bro. What if he goes, Hey, we signed this guy from <laughs> anywhere. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. What happens? You know, we, we picked up a guy from Mexico the year before halfway through camp and pitched 90 games in the big leagues. And it's unbelievable. Had a great year. So you never know what until they tell you. Yeah, so he calls me in the office, say, how do you feel, whoop de whoop You know, as long as you're healthy, after tomorrow, you're going to make the team. You know, I give him a big old hug, and he's like, hey, but you got to be healthy after tomorrow because they don't have to make that transaction. It's not an official move until the following day. Right, it's not over. Spring training's not over. No, you know, and so you go out there, and I'm throwing – you should have been like, I think I need an off day. <laughs> yeah, you know, like, you, you, you've heard, I've heard stories where, you know, hey, tomorrow you're going to the big leagues and you get hurt. Like, so facing the Cubs, I got the fifth or the sixth inning. I was so happy. They had already pulled all their starters. I faced double ear flap Johnny, two of them, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I, I don't know what lefty it was. It was a lefty that was in camp, good hitter. But I ended up going one, two, three. And Cora, you know, I'm coming down the steps. Cora goes, hey, how you feel? I'm good. You know, 
I'm healthy. To, you know, I'm healthy. healthy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, welcome to watch your step Red as Sox. you're walking down. <laughs> Hundred percent. Yeah, you know what I mean. <laughs> and so that was that was that time that was bigger than even the call up in Toronto because I knew it was gonna it was happening. You know, we're breaking. This is opening day, dude. This is you're gonna get to play. You're gonna get to pitch. Well, especially after four <clears throat> years ago, I got yeah. called up and you know teased big time. Day one, opening day, unbelievable. Got my family there, my wife, my kid, my one of my kids and my daughter Sutton was there. And don't pitch game one, don't pitch game two. No big deal. Bobby Pointer, another guy that made his debut the night before, has a not a t- he gets out of one inning, goes out for the next and has a tough one. I'm like, oh boy. He's got an unhittable fastball. This guy just gave up a five hundred foot homer. I still haven't pitched in the big leagues yet. <laughs> I don't know if you guys know, Tampa Bay's bullpen is on the field. Yes. Oh, so yeah. if your heart's pumping and you're throwing down towards home plate, boy, that's nerve-wracking. So I got called. My name got called on game two. I swear to you, my legs were shaking like I've never felt. Like I'm s- not nervous, but like so excited. And I'm like almost too much adrenaline. What? Not even almost, like way <laughs> past too much adrenaline. Like way past and and I end up getting sat down, and that's when Bobby comes in. We bring in a lefty. So I'm like, oh, all right, well, I didn't have to pitch. Like, that was nerve-wracking. I know the next one's not going to be as bad. So we end up winning the game. I don't throw, which is all good and gravy. Go up April Fool's Day. I end up making my debut, April 1. And uh, had it, you know, warming up, not the same. It was calm, not as calm, not normal. It's not a triple-A game. But it's it's a lot better on that that adrenaline rush, that heartbeat. And walking in the game, and AC, welcome to the big leagues. How is that? Can you go through, go through that moment of you just throw your last warm-up pitch in the bullpen? Yeah, and, and you, you have a, you have a routine. I know you have a routine mm-hmm. in Boston where you jump over the oh, oh yeah that spot. Do you have that on the road as well? Yeah, I mean it's, a, it's the line, or I mean it's just a definitive or line. line, or from the dirt to the grass. Yeah, for <clears> like in Boston, it's the dirt to the grass, or like from Tampa, it's the sideline. Or yeah, most of the most of the places were coming out of the from somewhere from the warning track. Yeah. I guess you would say, and you have a pretty good jog. Yeah, pretty quick. Did it feel like you were sprinting? That no. first one, how, what was I that mean, feeling like going and, and you know, core is right there at the mound. And then that moment, it's, I don't know. It, it, it's just fly, surreal. It, it's surreal. Like it just flies by. I mean, I just remember the first warm up pitch going, I'm here. Just throw it. Oh. Just don't screw it up, you know? <laughs> and because 20 feet out the back. Oh, uh, all the time. And that's when guys were like, Hey, once you threw your first one, like we knew you were dialed in. And uh, ended up facing Joey Wendell, my first at bat, and 0 1 cutter in double with a guy on first. And now I'm a little nervous. Now I'm facing Wilson Ramos, I believe. Wilson Ramos. And I met him in Venezuela two years previous. I know, like, I kind of know him a little bit, what big dude. Ended up getting a fly out to right. <sighs> Got out of the inning, go back up the next inning. Had a pretty good inning. Uh, I don't even know who I faced after that, honestly. I remember the first at bat and the second. And my next game was against Miami. And that's when I got my first punch out was Bork, which was sick. Who actually just signed to go to Japan? Yeah. You so, get that ball. Oh, yeah. Hey, Ramos. I got all of them. I got all of them. I got a lot. Ramos, good hitter, too, Wilson. He swings. I got, yeah, I got that one. I got first pitch, which was a strike, which is kind of tight. Cause, nice. Boy. Nervous. Um, first, was it just a straight fastball, or did you throw a cutter or a sinker? Cutter, cutter into Joey. I think it was. So you went back to back cutters on him. Oh yeah, that's my that's my best pitch, especially when you got extension barrel barrel swinging guy like him. Yeah. But yeah, I mean it was uh, those those first are kind of crazy, and it's here's the first that you might not. Who was the f- first homer you gave up? The first homer that I gave up to was Dwight Smith Jr. 301 feet. <laughs> uh, and I was the only guy in 18 that had more than two innings to not give up a homer. 
which was kind of cool. Like that's that's been a big part of my game a whole my whole life. Pitching wise is keeping the ball in the ballpark. So like for me, that's a big stat. And I mean, this year I threw whatever it was seventy eight 70. innings. Yeah. I gave up 10, 12 homers, which is still a pretty decent clip. One every nine is not bad. So who's the the biggest one you've given up? Where you where you're just like. Oh fuck! <laughs> um, that was Andy Diaz against the Rays. I actually gave up back-to-back homers that game. We were down four-two in the seventh, and I came in to face Diaz for the umpteenth time that year. And he knows I'm throwing sinker in. I just got him off the plate with sinker in, and I throw it, and it doesn't move. And it's on middle in, middle up, and he gets to it at Fenway. I mean, it had it might have landed on the highway. It was. I knew that was gone, and then I threw a one-two fork seamer away to Solaire. That was middle middle, and that was like his fourteenth of fifty this year. Yeah, um, he, had, he had a big year, big year. But I was like, oh, I'm gonna, you know, I just threw slider away. I'm gonna Vasquez heater away. I'm gonna I'm slide it by him. No, scouting reports right. He's always ready for the heater. And yeah. I mean, one-two with ninety-five middle middle and just boom, right over the freaking fountains out there. Now, the, what's the – I mean, like you're saying, you miss – you you get hurt on oh, that yeah. level. Oh, yeah. You know, and – Big time. You have to be right on your movement, all that kind of stuff. Um, let's go into – well, you actually got a ring. Mm-hmm. From 2018, from and breaking And you camp. were actually at a travel ball game oh, yeah. in the stands in watching, watching the game. In Hanford. And uh, – were you at there for the ring ceremony? Did you get? Oh yeah. So that's what was cool about this year is we we open up on the west coast. I don't make the team coming out of camp. I have a great spring training again. I gave up one run on a solo homer to Corey Dickerson. Same situation where I got to start. Now I'm starting against the Pirates, and I told my wife the same thing. We got three innings. We go up. We throw the ball well. We got a chance again. I gave up a solo homer to Corey Dickerson, who's actually mic'd up during the game, and I didn't know it. <laughs> and I'm like, he said, Drew, if he throws that pitch again, I got no chance. I don't throw the same pitch. I think I try to front, <laughs> you know, I try to front hip sink him, and he just shillelied it. It's another guy he, that rakes, too. Oh, uh, rakes. And, um, I so mean, one, there's there's no easy outs though. No. Like you you come in a game, it's no. there's never an easy out. No, that's no. what we're, we me and Brian talked about this the other day. Is the eighth hole guy will clip you at any time. You throw something, that get me over slider to somebody in the eight hole. He's going to clip you. Don't don't just it's not working like that anymore. Um, but nineteen where what, camp? So nineteen camp. I didn't make the team. I get sent down, and I'm. I'm furious. Like I'm, I had a great year. I'm 31 years old. I really only got 25 days last year, which was epic. But at the same time, it was 25 days, and don't make the team on day nine. Somebody gets hurt. Brian Johnson gets hurt, and I get called up to go to Arizona for the 10th game of the year. Ring ceremonies are at home, first opening day at home. So I end up going to Arizona, pitch in. What day was that? I think that was the first day I got there. I ended up throwing Hector Velasquez through three innings, and I threw two and a third or something on the backside and ended up getting the win. We came back from behind. Mitch, I think Mitch Moreland hit a big homer in the fourth. Yeah. You know it. Um, so I think heading back home to Boston, and ring ceremonies are the first game. So it was sick that I was able to be there and and get my ring with the rest of the team. That. And just that ring's probably huge. That's somewhere in a it'll, safe. It'll fill. It'll fill my hand up. I got pretty big hands. So That's crazy. It'll, uh, it's a big ring. Let's get more into nineteen because we uh, hold on. Do you need to handle something? No. Nope. You don't need. Oh, okay. Just making sure. No, we're good. We're talking. At the break, you almost had about eight wins. Mm-hmm. Eight and one. Twenty nineteen. Yeah, yeah in twenty nineteen. Past year. Yep. And. uh no all star appearance, and I know all of us back home are like, "Whoa, what? he's got the most wins on the team, even <laughs> and out of the pen, and, out I'm of the like, pen, and uh, with a sub three ERA." You know what? Uh, I know that could be a little disappointing, but um, having a great year. Did you have hopes of that being an, happening? So that's where baseball will humble you with the best of them. You know, so uh, I'm trying to think. We'll call it middle of May. 
we're about a month and a half into this thing. Me and Barnes are throwing the ball. Unreal. I mean, Barnes has got a point nine. He's throwing 98, 99 with hammers. He's, nobody's getting a hit off him. Workman's throwing the ball really well. He's got a one, two. I'm throwing the ball really well. You know, and people start talking about that. Hey, an all-star game, this and that. This game will humble you in a heartbeat. You're like, man, if I just throw this many pitches or, you know, I got six more outings. I got what I gave up a five spot in a heartbeat to the Yankees and a five spot to the uh, Tigers. And you're like, what just happened? This whole all star thing, we got none chance now. You know, so that's where I don't, man. Did I think I had a chance early? Yeah. But, I mean, we've had some guys that it's hard as a reliever. I think it's like four relievers and four closers. You know, so they, these guys are having. 35, 20, 25 saves at the break. Those are the guys that are getting that all-star bid. But, I mean, we had a lot of guys with the Red Sox that had breakout years that had no chance of getting, being an all-star. I think Bogey ended up getting the last call. But, I mean, Bogey was hitting 310 with 23, 25 at the break. Yeah. Devers was hitting three-something with, I mean, Unreal, unreal year. Yeah, that guy's bad, man. He's a bad yeah. dude. Yeah. And then when Vasquez didn't get voted in, he went off for about three weeks, and he might have hit 450. <laughs> yeah. And those three weeks did have a good stretch. The the the, uh, the vote and the actual All Star game, there was some some big 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 time out of him. What's that like watching those guys work, like J D Martinez and and a guy like Mookie, like watching that you're out there shagging balls, and you just like, is it? I mean, because Mookie's not a huge dude. Mookie's. But he can hit a ball a mile. Oh, he can hit it a He's, mile. He can. <laughs> ridiculous. I, I still try to figure out where it comes from. You know, like, you watch him swing, and you're like, I just, I don't get it. Because he can, and he can do it the same with the golf ball. He can square it up. I mean, that kid, he, freak athlete. And bowling. Oh, so on, on real bowler. But, I mean, that's, he, uh, those guys, just listening to him, those two talk. I mean, they, it's, it's impressive on what, what they're looking at, what kind of keys they're looking for. Um, but like them trying to watch over and look out for like Michael Chavis, a guy that's got some huge upside, trying to tweak some things, trying to get to some pitches that he wasn't able to get to, that got exposed a little bit. But I mean, they're, they're all talking to him. They're all working with him and, and in the cage. And JD does a lot of work. He, I don't even know the number of swings he takes. I mean, it's every day we have a, we have an extra BP thrower in there so he can hit during the game if he's DHing. So if, if it's a righty, it's a righty. If it's a lefty, he's got a lefty guy in there throwing BP to him, working on getting his slots because that's all his is. He's just trying to manipulate his barrel into the ball, I guess. So that's uh, – and I don't understand it. I don't want – he's he's a nerd, man. He's, he's so – He's so smart into what he's doing in those at-bats and how his body's working. You know, it's not just see it and hit it. He's way past that in his game. Um, but watching him and Mookie and and even getting into some of the older vets with, with Mitch Moreland, that just watching over guys was unreal to, to see that teammate, team camaraderie. But that's the closest thing to indie ball. The closest thing to big leagues you'll get is indie ball, guys that are looking out for each other. Think about in AAA – if it's me or you going to the big leagues, I don't want it to be you. Right. Yeah. You're right. And so that's that's where in the big leagues everybody's it's one goal, win tonight. That's our goal. We gotta win tonight. Doesn't worry about, you know, yesterday doesn't matter, the triple A team doesn't matter tonight. And so that's where you start seeing that more and more, especially at that big league level, guys that have been around a long time helping out the young kids. Which I mean on the pitching side, Rick Porcello was that's who I went to. I'm sure there were some clips of after I threw an inning and I knew I was done, I'm going right to Rick. Rick, what'd you, like right here, what would you think? Or he'd be like, why would you throw that pitch? This is what we thought. It's either Rick or Sandy Leon. Those were the two guys, and it's, uh, it's going to be tough for me because those are the two that I leaned on, and they're both going to be gone this year. So Sandy ended up getting traded over to Cleveland, and, and Rick signed with the Mets. So, But those were the two guys that I, I went to a lot and asking on – how to determine situations or what pitch to throw, what was I thinking, what my effort level. Me and Rick talked a lot about certain pitches and how to manipulate sinkers. I mean, that's all we do. 
So it was good to have him. And I grew up watching Rick in the big leagues and I was in the minor leagues. So having him as a teammate was unreal. And what would you tell some of the youth right now, some guys out here? And, and would you guys, you know, have kids come into DIB? And what are the, some of the things that you preach to, to the youth? Uh, I mean, it's not going to be an easy road. Don't think it is. Um, but if if you're, you know, just like everything else in life, it's whatever your goals are, are you willing to take the long road, long road to them? You know, everybody wants this short, easy route, and I want to go – Go play college. Well, at what college? If you want to go to Cal State Fullerton, USC, or Roberts, you you better step your game up. You want to go to you know somewhere in Montana to go play baseball? We could get you there, you know. And and that's where you are gonna you are gonna determine how hard you what your goals are gonna determine how hard you want to work. I've always wanted to play in the big leagues my whole life. I still do. I I've told Nicole if I could play for ten more years, I'd be happy. I'll be 41. Is it going to happen? Probably not. Would I love it to? Yeah, because I love the grind of of the everyday to keep going. Um, You know, we had a group of guys in here earlier today that are, most of them are either in college or professional guys right now, pitchers. We had nine of them in here today at eh, 10 to about 2 o'clock. You know, so I think the more guys that you can get with your group, if it's, Clovis West High School, if it's anybody, if it's Clovis North or Memorial, or you get your group of guys that like to work and you stay together and you find a time to work out and you hold each other accountable, that's how you're going to build. But what I see a lot personally is this kid from Memorial wants to work really hard and he doesn't want to open the door to the four other kids that might want to work hard if they see what hard work looks like. They think they're working hard. They're going to a gym or whatever. And doing 20 minutes of bench press, this guy's over here really trying to get it and understands the program and doing whatever gets a program from Eric Cressy, but he doesn't want to share that info or bring people around him to push him harder. Or they're all saying, oh, you go to this guy. We don't like that. You know, that's, that's eyewash. I don't really care who people work with, honestly, straight up. I don't care as, but as long as you're working now, can the knowledge be a little better from some people to the other? Yeah, right. But I've had 35 pitching coaches. Ten of them were not very good. But I pulled something from those 10 guys and won easily something. I've had 10 really good coaches that I attribute a lot of my success that have helped me. But you got to be able to keep, and it's putting those people around you is my my biggest thing. Getting a group of guys that hold you accountable, push you every day. I'm going to be working out on Christmas Day. That's just like, and I asked the guys, hey, you guys want to do it? That's where I'm going to be in my life. You go back to those Garza workouts and yeah. like, you know what I mean? Like, and, this and is. What we did with Garza was Garza sent a text message, hey, seven o'clock here. Now that's kind of what I do. Obviously, I got two baby girls, my wife at home. I'm in and out of town. Hey, I'm going to work out at 11. Either you're going to be there at 11 or you're not. But that workout's starting. And so the guys that are, into that program that are that are with me it's pretty easy it's not very hard i mean two days ago we worked out at 7 a.m yesterday today we worked out at 11 <clears throat> but days that we're throwing we're setting it up early and and trying to we're doing a throwing we're doing all of our velo stuff on our rap soto like i just threw a bullpen today a front a front toss i guess on a rap soto and then being able to work out with seven other dudes that are pushing you to get your five sets of of uh whatever we're doing the squats in today, right? If I was there by myself, I'd probably throw into a net, play catch nice and easy and three sets in a squat. I'd be like, ah. you didn't feel like you got do enough I, out of your workout. Do, do I need to do that do, one? Do I need two more? You yeah. need to get that push. But if a 18 year old kids goes, man, that kid's one, he the wants big your job. last year. Well, he wants yeah. your job. hundred percent. Yeah. Well, and they come and see you and it's like, I got to live up to what their standard is. Cause that's what I do. They look at me, they look at me like this and I've got to, I got to maintain this for them. He can't outwork me cause then I'm not. Yeah. Now, now you got a kid that's, that's 10 years younger than you. That's going to outwork you. Your game, you're not going to last too long in the game. No. Right. And same thing as an 18 year old, you're going to let a 10, a guy that's 10 years older than you that probably didn't get the same amount of sleep or did anything that you did last night. You think, you know, you're going to let him outwork you? No. So you just naturally push each other into getting it done. 
you know, and that's my, that's my favorite way to work out. And I think it just pushes, especially young kids into that, into that mindset. You know, I see a lot of one-on-one sessions with coaching and I think hitting and pitching specific stuff has to be one-on-one. You're going to learn, you're going to understand. But when you start working with training or group setting, you need people that are going to push each other in that same skill level, right? I have a, a throne program here right, that we're running right now. We got 25 kids in it. Not all 25 are doing the exact same thing, right? Because I got a 14 year old kid that hasn't matured yet. I got a 15 year old kid that's fully matured and I got guys that are in college, right? So how do we, how do we get those three different groups or four different groups and push each other to be the best they can be? Right. So there might be a group of only three or four kids in one group. And the other group, like my older kid group has 12 in it. But that sophomore in high school that's mature is going to learn from that freshman in college. Yeah. You know, I don't need to be the one teaching him. It's they're going to learn from each other. And that's honestly the best way that I've found out guys pushing each other or learning. It's amongst yourselves. Right. It's podcast. It's little chalk talks, man. I mean, we pulled the kids in the other day and just write up a question about pitching. I don't care what it is. It's not about me. It's about you pitching. If it's a grip, if it's uh, a thought process, if it's whatever it is, bring it up. Because if you have the question, everybody else does too, right? I didn't get any of these an- questions answered when I was even 25. Yeah. You know, and that's what I think just opening opening people's minds a little bit more to the, the thought process of what baseball is really going on. Or, you know, like I've told people, it's we're not playing chess or we're not playing checkers. Right, it's the same board. We're ch- we're playing chess. It's how do we get above that guy? If he makes this reaction, how do I counter that? And so that's what my whole pitching side of it is. I know you start talking about some of the hitters and they're combating it, right? But that's all it is. It's what is their reaction? How do I combat it? How do I change it on the mound? If it's whatever pitches or the way you're locating, all of it. So, but I think guys learn and understand more and more as they're in groups together and can feed off of each other more. Yeah. I I mean, you think about it, even in college and pro ball, you're with your, your boys in the cages all day. You're with your boys in the bullpen going over grips and, and all playing catch, day. you know, you're not really with the coach or the instructor all that much. And you're building those relationships and, but pushing each other and playing games off the back net or, you know, I'm going to throw the four zone, mm-hmm. you know, and do that kind of stuff. So, um, and then it's all the ways that are going to make you better yeah. in the game. And you're just opening your mind to what people are saying. And then you're going, <clears throat> all right, I like these two. I want, I like this slider grip and this one. Hey coach, what do you got? Like, this is what we've been talking about. I got these two. What do you think? But now you've already thought about the process. You've already tried some stuff out amongst you and your peers. And now you're going to come up to the coach with an, with a, a legitimate question, not, Hey coach, how do you throw a slider? What? No, that's no, that's not how it, that's not how it starts. Hey coach, I like this grip, but I'm I'm feeling this on my finger. Now we can talk. You you've actually tried something, right? You're not just walking in. Hey Chad, I want to build a house. <laughs> you got anything? You got a material? You got money? You got some house? No, that's not how it shows up, dude. The slider just doesn't show up, right? We got to try. We got to work on some things. I mean, it took me six years of, and I ended up going back to the very first slider I ever threw 12 years later is the slider I'm throwing now, the slider I threw at FCC. And that's what, I mean, I went away from it. I thought that was what caused my elbow issues. No, but it was a lot of bad mechanics and other things that were going on. But, you know, changing those grips and how things feel, working on things, but that's where having the analytics and having – the technology that we're available now is unreal. I mean, I've used that rep soda like crazy. That's all I've thrown on. Anytime I throw is on it. Just like if you were going to hit, why wouldn't you measure something? You're going to hit, you know, tell me what my launch angle is and my, and my VLO and things like that. If you understand how to read them, right? Otherwise you should be hitting on a field in my opinion. That's why we hit on the field. All right. You've got to see how the balls are spinning, how they're hit, how they're carrying to left, how they're carrying to right. That's why our guys hit on the field every, not every day, but when they do, if they're not looking at that, then they're not. Usually they're taking the off day. So that's where having that technology, let's use it. I mean, everybody in college programs, I mean, Stanford's got yeah, I think they have eight hit there. tracks now. They got everything. 
you know, so that's where the game's kind of going, which is scary for a lot of the older people in the game. But I think it's you got to have that happy medium of both. You know, you got to have you got to understand the analytics, but also understand can this guy clutch up, you know, with two strikes and two outs, or is he going to windle down and just cave? Because if he's the best hitter on planet Earth and he's going to windle down, he's nobody, right? You don't want him on. You, he's not going to do anything for you. Mm-hmm. So that's where using those technologies, using using the people and the resources that we have in, in Fresno. I mean, we got some pretty good resources. We got some guys that can coach and some pretty good facilities, in my opinion. But just get out there and keep working, keep grinding. I know me and my brother, I know you we've hit before mm-hmm. way back, but it was bucket of balls at Central High. Man, we threw three people, one hit, one threw, one was shagging balls. You know? <laughs> it was always the youngest <laughs> yeah, one. <laughs> and I was the one shagging balls. You know? <laughs> I was not throwing BP. I was, they weren't letting that happen. Um, you get to pitch in Yankee Stadium? I did, man. What was that? Well, I mean, even Fenway, I mean. Yeah, you're Fenway's, already playing for one of the most geez, prestigious ways. So, this, I love Fenway. I love Fenway. The fans, sick. But, I got to go there as a fan before I actually got to play on the field. That fan experience is something else. That is. I watched uh, Sunday Night Baseball uh, against the Yankees on the wall. And it was, that was epic. That was crazy. So I could see how the fan, like I tell people, I think seeing it as a fan is a lot different than as a player. Like as a player, I'm I'm walking in and out of the 1912 everything. Yeah. As a fan, you're like, oh my gosh, that thing's so old. It's from 1912. But I got to use it. And so like our bathroom, for instance, or like our bullpen is just, it's just old. It's awesome. But you, then you go to like New York City <laughs> and it's, I mean, you got Flat screens everywhere. You're enclosed. It doesn't matter what the weather is outside. You don't got to deal with fans until you step out. And once you step out, it's game on. Them fans are crazy up there. The stands, the uh, the bleachers up there in the left left field are good. But we had, I had, when was that? Early August. One of our, our 12-year-old DIB teams going to Cooperstown, New York. Drew can plan some schedules pretty well. So... The four days in front of their Cooperstown, New York, were at home. The weekend that they start, that everybody flies into New York, that Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we're in New York. After the tournament, we're at home against the Angels. So Drew set it up. Guys were coming in, coming out. I had some guys in Fenway the few days before. <clears throat> Drew and about four to six other people, I forgot who was all there, was in New York. In the bleach, in the left field bleachers, that First game Friday night against the Yankees. Sick. I knew they were there. I talked to them before the game. I didn't know really where they were sitting, what's going on. I get out in the fourth inning. I walk outside. Damn, Drew's up top with all the fools, like the crazies. They're crazy up there. They're crushing beer, yelling, screaming. And I get out there. I'm coming up in the fifth. I get hot in the fourth. Don't get in. Come up in the fifth. He's facing nine one two. All right, you got Judge. All right, I got Judge. Cool. I get up, I start throwing, and the fans are going crazy. They're loving it, and it's right after the uh, our team's full of savages, or you know, we yeah. got savages at the, the plate. Savages in the box. Yeah, we got savages in the box, and I throw my third or fourth warm up pitch, and this guy goes, "Hey, Walden, you ready?" We got a bunch of savages in the box, and I'm thinking, "Damn, dude, you're right. Judge is six seven. <laughs> Damn it. You know, like you you think about it and you laugh it off and it's like, eh, it doesn't really matter. It's, you know, execute the slider away. But I mean, this shit, it's some of the stuff is comical that they're saying, but then you, they say that and you're like, it's like a reality check. Like, oh shit, you're right. Like I'm face, I'm walking into face judge Sanchez and DD. Like you ain't joking. And, uh, but so the fans and they're, those are the guys right next to Drew and some of the boys from DIB and it's, they're yelling at him yelling at me they're not wearing any uh red Sox clothes just black and silver dib clothes finishing i go in punch out judge on four or five pitches punch him out on a slider down and away and so drew gets a video of the boys and hey give my boys some props and they're all awesome just yeah you know fresno on fresno you know good to see good to see 
Walden finally did it. You know, Walden did his thing on that one inning. We're going to get him. You know, like they're all they're all huge Yankee fans, and but it's just cool to to see that from the looking at it from the fan side also and seeing what's going on. So I mean, some of those Yankee games though, like just the respect of the the respect the that they player. have. Yeah, yeah. You know that, like even though you're a Red Sox, and I should hate you more than anything. Yeah, like you went out and did your thing, and they and and they re, they respect that when it's you know kind of not I don't want to say asked upon, but you know yeah. they, they and you don't see that a whole lot. In uh, well, they try to break you, and when you oh. when you don't let it get to you, and you go and shut them down, it's like yeah, or you, you don't or you, you don't gotta react t- to this. Yeah, you got to yeah, tip you, your cap. Yeah, you can't you can't react to it because then it just gets more and more, and it's how is that? How is that the face to see and judge in a box? I mean, he's a big human. I mean, <laughs> he's huge, but you're definitely like that I can't stuff. Miss. Though, like, I, yeah, I can. But I mean, but you're not thinking like that, no, right? No, I mean, you're, you're a big leaguer. He's a big leaguer. Hundred percent. Like, I'm hundred percent. We're yeah. He's six seven, two hundred eighty five pounds. You're focused on but what? I, but I have this on, unhittable pitch that yeah. I'm going to throw him. Every hitter has something that you can throw. So it's what is it, or can you do it? Like. Would some people say, like Mike Trout, not because he's the best hitter in the game, that's the worst matchup I could possibly face in my life. The worst. I throw everything down, he hits everything down. Yeah. He His biggest hole is up and in. I can't, I can't put a ball there if I tried. So I'm facing him in, in August, August 1, or September 1, I guess. Oh, oh, slider with a guy on second base. Get him a little corker, a little, little capper at the end. And I think I got him. And that's when I was like, oh. And ends up falling short. <clears throat> ends up falling short, but I'm like, dude, that was my one chance I could always say because I'll probably never face him again. I mean, ever, the last three times I've pitched against him, it was I come in right after Trout or, hey, Trout's up, bring somebody else in. Yeah. You know, we're going to get a better matchup. This is not one for me. you know. Um, but there's guys that would rather face Trout on my team than face Calhoun. Just depending Calhoun's, on their stuff. Yeah, Calhoun scares them because Calhoun's clipped them. He's but, pesky, man. Oh, yeah. You know, you hang a break ball in the zone, it ain't. You're asking for another one. So, you know, each guy has their own who they're facing kind of thing. Like, I think I'll still face Bregman and Correa and Gary L next year when we face Houston. Am I going to have to attack them a different way? Yeah, we're going to see where they are. But you're also at. mentally prepared before the game. For sure. You know that that's your role. It's not like, oh, Walden, you're, uh, you're facing two, three, four. You already knew that. Well, yeah, but that two, three, four could be the same style of hitter batting six, seven, and eight, and that's who I'm going to face. Yeah. So, like with Houston, I, in Houston, I ended up getting a save, and it was, I mean, I knew that was one of the cooler days just because before the game starts, you're not the closer. It's all right. Let's see how if it plays out. All right. I got Bregman, Correa, Gary L. I might add a guy in the front or the back, but that's who I'm going to face on this team. They're the only three guys that sinkers are better pitches and forcing fastballs. I'm the only sinker baller on the team. That's my guys. So they finish in the six. Our starter gets through them. All right, well, I got him in the seventh or the eighth. They come up in the eighth. Barnes is throwing in the eighth. I'm getting hot. I have Bregman, next hitter. We're up three to two, I think, in the eighth. Barnes walks the bases loaded and ends up getting out of it. So now, obviously, I knew I was, like, how that whole game from the seventh on, I knew I was throwing the ninth, which was just how that whole, how the lineups flip and all that. And so that was one of the cooler things walking into that ninth inning. And then getting hot in the eighth and going, I might get a one plus. <laughs> like, like those are hard to come by. Like, I mean, we see it in the playoffs all the time. Guys are closers. The one pluses are they're few and far between, right? So, I mean, that's. So having that's when I really knew AC had a lot of faith in me, and then going in and getting that big inning, and I think I ended up facing Reddick for the last out on a terrible slider. It's at three hundred ninety-two feet, and the fence is three ninety-four, you know, <laughs> by an inch. Yeah. So I mean, but that was one of the cooler days, just walking in and like facing Judge in New York was good, but it's a big situation. We got guys on I think second and third with two outs. Yeah, that's a big situation, but how the games play out and ended up being in the ninth inning and getting a save in Houston was my family was there, which was kind of tight. Drew was there. Drew was there. Was that your first save? No, that's my Uh, first real save. So I got a save the year before in 18, a three inning save against Baltimore. Um, So that was my first save. Houston was my first, 
I would say my first real save. The ninth inning guy yeah. coming out. Coming out and, and <clears throat> cleaning up. And then I got one more for one batter against Tampa. We had a guy try to get a one-plus save. I was only available to throw one to two batters, and I ended up getting called. And two outs. Yeah, two outs. Guys on first and second facing Tommy Pham. Second and third, maybe, something like first and third. Whatever it was, we were only up one. And <laughs> and uh, Pham's up, and I might have had bases loaded. I did have bases loaded. I walked him in. I faced Pham, and we're like, all right, sinker's in, sinker's in. He'll chase it. Well, he was taken, and I threw four straight balls. and just pff, Sinker in, ball off the plate, ball. All right, sinker down and in again, ball. I ended up walking him four straight, walking the – we were up by two. Walk in. Now we got winning runs on second, facing Austin Meadows. Probably when we were facing them, that was the guy we couldn't let it beat us. Yeah. So our whole goal was we had to get fam. And being able to go up and face Meadows, I went what throw? I went backdoor cutter, cutter up and in, got a piss missile, ground ball to first, and ended up getting out of it. But that was kind of cool to, you know, same same situation, just how those games play out was how we kind of ran our bullpen. It's a lot different than, you know, like the year before we had Craig on the back end. It's ninth inning Craig. Not so ahead. traditional. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and once we put Workman in that back end of the bullpen, I think that changed a lot. I mean, Workman threw the ball well for that last half, and he still had, he had sub two. And Well, you have enough arms there. to do it. Now you're not abusing guys, and, and you can get through a good road trip or, yep, that's or, a, or that's not rely on your starters to go deep. Yeah, and that, I mean – that's kind of the we're hoping our our starters this year and give us a couple more and they will. I mean, I think we were all hitting that that uh, injury injury bug a little yeah. bit. Guys were just they were throwing through a lot of stuff and that's what that's what hurts, you know. I and mean, that's where if he's healthy goes seven. If he's really banged up, he's not pitching. Somebody else is pitching, but now he's going to go four, and then this kind of aggravates a little bit. So now he could still throw two more innings, but now at what risk? You know, so that's kind of where Sale was this year a little bit and, and DP. And I actually was just out in Florida and talked to him a little bit. And they're both good. They're ready to go. And I'm excited for this His year. DP, they, I heard his name go around a little bit about being traded. <clears throat> uh, we talked about it this a little bit. I got no clue. I absolutely couldn't tell you. I've heard DP was rumored, and I heard the Dodgers want Mookie. Outside no. of that, I don't got Who doesn't clue. want Mookie? Well, I mean, I mean, they had that, you know, his last, right when uh, Price came out of that last game, you know, there was some people. Oh, yeah. A little emotional about that. Yeah. Thinking I mean, that he's out, you know, he wasn't coming back, but. No, I mean, I think. It's not a sure deal yet. No. I mean, I think Mookie will, I think we're going to go after it again. I mean. You think. You, you have the team to do it. You do. And, you and do. I think we got some, some unbelievable pieces, obviously, and. The only thing I you guys didn't get Pedroia back. From what I heard the other day, P- Petey's ready. Is he? When I uh, I talked to AC not too long ago, and he Pedroia called AC and said, hey, "I'll be ready." So if that happens, I think that's. I honestly think that's what we missed more than anything last year was just a, that veteran, that, that full fledged leader. Yeah. I mean, that dude never is at a nine. It's a ten all day. Every day, and he brings he brings it. He's wild. He's a California guy too. Yeah, he went to Arizona State. <laughs> yeah. Before we get going, I just we've always asked the, our big leaguer guys. Did you ever have a superstar? Just a, a moment where it's like, holy shit! Dustin Pedroia. I mumbled his name as I shook his hand. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it, like that was that was one of them. Uh, we've had some cup like so. My first I guess one, being on the Red Sox, you're, you're surrounded, kind of surrounded, by, surrounded by more than normal. Yeah, but that's that's just that's one of them because he's yay tall, but his stature is 20 feet. You know, yeah. like this guy's crazy. Um, I met Miguel Cabrera in Venezuela in Madagascar when I was playing for him my first year, and that was pretty. First guy, I wish it was. It's the first guy that I got a baseball signed by, Venezuelan pro ball. With Miguel Cabrera on it, which was pretty, that was pretty good. But starstruck, like mumbling, probably Pedro. Yeah. Day one, in the middle of the clubhouse, like an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> and then, which was cool, because like eight days later, I'm eating breakfast with my parents, and 
Pedroia and Hanley Ramirez come up and introduce themselves to my parents. And my dad was like, oh, like this shell shock. Oh, this is where he gets it from. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and so that was kind of one of the cooler things, especially being there for like 10 days and then being you're talking Pedroia and Hanley. Like they could up. easily have been like, oh, Rook. He's probably not even going to be here. It probably won't even give him the head nod kind of thing, yeah. you know, and they came up and straight up introduced themselves to my, my dad. And it was, that was pretty cool. One more, one more. Cause I know there's one and I think this, <coughs> whoever this guy is on YouTube is a, is a douche. A, a B's in the bigs. Oh yeah. Yeah. There's a guy on YouTube that literally has an at bat. So I was, I want to see if he hit, I was researching a little bit and there's a, it's you taking a strike three in Arizona. Hundred oh, yeah, percent. That's all it is. It's the last pitch. You should have. They should have shown the first three. <laughs> I did the same thing. And you looked pissed that you didn't swing at it. No, I was advised not to. Oh, really? Not to swing. Yeah. And so, <laughs> this is my debut for nineteen. It's the first day I got called back up. I'm pumped. I'm finally back in the big leagues. I'm pitching. I just threw up a freaking huge zero. And now they're like, hey, you're leading off. And you're probably, knowing you, you're like, I'm going to hit a bomb. Well, like, like I, I'm down to hit, but I haven't hit in 13 years. I know, I know but bro, I know you. Bro, no. <laughs> you throw a slider, I'm missing. <laughs> I'm throwing them, I'm not hitting them. And so I get up there and AC, he's like, hey, don't swing. Okay. He's like, no, don't swing. Just stand there. All right, I got it. They told me don't swing eight more times as I'm walking up to the on-deck circle. They can't afford for you to get hurt. We just had an injury. Yeah. I was, right, we got one more day on the West Coast before we go back east. And I'm like, all right, well, whatever. I'm not swinging. So I don't even bring my glasses up. I got no batting gloves on. Hey, let me get the smallest helmet. Whose helmet? Mookie's. So I get Mookie's helmet. I got Mookie's bat. And I'm just standing there. And the catcher is J.R. John Ryan Murphy, who I played with with the Twins three years previous, who caught me for... 12 of my 15 whatever outings. And so first pitch, heater, 88, middle, middle, strike. Yep, cool. All right. <laughs> Murph goes, what are you doing without batting gloves or glasses? I go, you know what I'm doing here. I don't need to answer. You know, like, like <laughs> you know what I'm doing. Let's go. <laughs> Next pitch, ball. And so Murph takes his mask off and goes, hey, hey, he's not swinging. And I didn't know he did that. And that was, I mean, next two pitches, middle, 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 like 88, 90, <sighs> whatever. Walking back to the dugout. And Alex comes up to me, AC comes up to me after the next at bat, or like after who I think Mookie was leading off, or Benny was leading off at the time. So after Benny's at bat, he's like, hey, did you tell them you weren't swinging? I go, AC, did you not see the whole show? Like, I walked up there, no batting gloves, no glasses on. The guy caught me for three years, and I never took a bat off my shoulder. I don't got to tell him anything, dude. He knows I'm not swinging. So if I <laughs> – I'll probably never take BP again because of this also. So later on in the year, I'm getting ready for Philly. We're getting ready to go to Philly. We're playing Philly at home. We're going to Philly in five days. Hey, Walden, go take some BP. Go take some swings in the cage. We got two or three other guys. Our starters are hitting BP. All right. I'm not hitting in the cage. I'm going to hit on the field. I'm at Fenway. I'm not hitting in the cage. <laughs> right? So they're throwing BP. Our bullpen catcher's throwing BP on the field. And me and three other guys go hit. First swing, dude. I get jammed up. First. <laughs> haven't taken a sw I haven't taken a swing with a bat in three years, four years probably. Jammed up. And I was like, <sighs> I just got over my thumb being hurt. And now my thumb ended up being hurt for like another 20 days, not being able to throw certain pitches and like just the little knickknack nonsense doing dumb stuff like hitting BP when I shouldn't. And now I can't throw a sinker to some of the best hitters in the world. And that's why I'm in there to throw the sinker, you know, so just being an idiot sometimes, but <laughs> that's why I'll probably, I think the whole, I bat things out. I think I'm over that no, my, that's not in my in my career. I just thought that was trash <laughs> that somebody just put up your strike three. It's like an eleven awful. second clip. I didn't even know that. Yeah. I'll I've, show had, it. I'll I've show. had some pitchers have some some horror stories on that. You know, like one of my good buddies was Dan Runsler. Oh yeah. He was with the Giants. He was with the Giants. Awesome. Yeah. Talking about one of the guys that helped me out in my career. Bro, unbelievable human in the big leagues, gets in that bat, tears his ACL. You know, like yeah. I'm like, at least that didn't happen. Or like yeah, work, no. you know. 
And and so, but that whole time they're like, hey, you're taking, you're taking. And on the bus that night, we're heading back to, I think we were heading home after that. Yeah. You know, we got guys on the back of the bus going, what kind of shit is that? Like this guy's a freak athlete, you know, and can throw 95, but we're not going to let him hit. We're tie ball game in the fifth, you know, and guys. But they and, don't have to manage the club, right? They're they're not looking out, you know. They're trying to see if I can hit a homer. <laughs> you know, they're saying, "Why not? This guy's uh, he can do it." I mean, if you if he gets one, but no, I mean, I'm. If they would have told me to swing, I'm not getting a hit. I'll tell you that right now. I mean, same outcome, probably one less pitch, throw three in a row. Probably just swung, swung at the ball. You know what I mean? So, I mean, I'm not I'm not embarrassed to say that I'm not going to hit. Put a golf ball. I'll hit a golf ball though. Yeah. Oh my god! Well, no, you're a big leaguer. Yeah, but I'm not gonna. You're not paid to hit. No, exactly. Pitch and and go into this year and have some fun, man. Yeah, we'll get into 2020. You know, um, go through that. What we talked about a little bit before we got on. Yeah. What you, what it looks um, like for you? So going to camp, I'll sign as long as I stay on the 40 man roster, which I presume the uh, I'll sign a big league split. So it'll be a salary at the big league level per day, and then a salary on the minor league side in AAA or anywhere under that. Um, but, yeah, just like we were, he was saying, hey, you're out of options. Well, I got one more. So last year I was down 13 days. To l- use your option, you got to be down for 20. So I ended up keeping my option. They can still send me down to AAA at no penalty in essence. Um, but after that – one more year of that, then I have to stay in the big leagues. Or if they want to send you down, take you off the 25 man, they DFA you. So, I mean, I would rather keep my option and no, I got a really good chance walking into the big leagues, not walking into the big leagues, but fighting for a spot in AAA, being on the 40 man roster. I think the 40 man roster is huge after being, it took me four years to get back to it. Um, I don't, just one of those things talking about taking it for granted. Yeah. Every, everybody talks about, they think the grass is greener on the other side, and it's not greener. You know, you still got to work your tail off. You still got to do a lot of things. Um, it's just a matter of, on my level, it's having the right guy like you and like what you do, like how you go about your business, and what you do off the field means just as much as you do on the field. Um, you know, I think, we talk about some of the younger kids, is they just want to keep transferring from school to school or travel ball team to travel ball team instead of thinking it's greener on the other side. You know, if I had it my way, I'd play with the Red Sox the next six, seven years of my career and come back to Fresno. But if that's going to happen, awesome. I'll go all the way through arbitration with them. Um, that would be a, a dream thing. You're playing for the freaking Boston Red Sox, dude. It's yeah. it's a uh, it's a pretty good, pretty cool gig, and the city is awesome. I just don't do the cold too well. April and uh, April and September are a little tough. <laughs> Well, those have been pretty good, man. I, I appreciate you uh, sitting down with us, man. This is awesome. Not a problem. Letting us use the facility here at DIB. Been hearing yeah. probably noise, you know, all, the hold's all good. Some bats swinging in there, guys getting work in. But, uh, no, man, this is fantastic. For sure. Yeah, I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, good luck to you this year. We're always pulling for you. You know, you're yep. a hometown boy. And I was fortunate enough to work out with you while we were oh, still yeah. in the plane. Um, but, yeah, we – want nothing but the best for you and hope uh, everything goes good perfect man thank you very much well everybody that's episode 33 of the hit or die podcast hit or die you can get the hit or die podcast on itunes spotify spreaker and iHeartRadio. the show is also available on youtube for news and updates about the show or to get involved check us out on facebook and twitter at hit or die podcast